Um, for those of you who do not know the firm's work site, um, and I suspect there are very few of you who don't know it, it's in eastern Dumfrieshire and lies uncomfortably close, I'm sure, if you were a native to the uh, western end of Hadrian's Wall, uh, the lower dots, Carlisle. And the site itself you can be seen on the northern skyline from pretty much the whole of the western end of Hadrian's Wall. The complex itself, as uh, Jack has said, uh, is a seven hectare um, Iron Age fort crowning the 1,000 feet high summit of Burnswark Hill and it's flanked most notably by two Roman camps which are so striking that uh, the uh, earthworks can be seen from space. And when you look at it in close up, um, it consists of two very unusual shaped camps. The north camp has a clavicular um, shaped entrance here, very elongated, it looks like two camps stuck together. And the southern one has two, uh, has two main features. One is what has always been called a fortlet in its north eastern corner and three gate covers um, elongated mound like tituli um, that are still three meters in height and they've always been interpreted up to relatively recently as ballista platforms. So when you look at the site from the south um, the first thing that you notice is that there's a modern plantation here on the uh, eastern side of the summit and that has precluded um, uh, our searches in that particular area. These are the three titulae, and this is the so-called fortlet in the northeastern corner, um, which has been reinterpreted recently as a, a native homestead. And you can see the way the camp has actually um, uh, been angled to take in that homestead. This is the northern um, uh, camp. Um, facing the northern aspect of the fort, which is much steeper than the southern aspect. So what's the, what's the big question? Uh, what's going on here? Is it a siege? Is it a true siege? Has there been an investment by the Roman army um, to either starve out or, or assault the, the native population on the summit? Or is it indeed a training ground as described by numerous uh, Roman authors um, that the Roman army would train as if in actual battle? And how would you differentiate? Is there any way at all that we can differentiate between these two? And we're going to look um, a little bit at the role of new technology and perhaps lead us to a different or a slightly different understanding of the relationship between the fort and the, uh, the Roman camps. Um, it's so noticeable, Burns' work, that it appears in the very first uh, edition of the Society's Transactions in 1792. Um, and uh, at that point was preferred uh, as an anonymous paper. But just about anybody who's anybody in Romano-Caledonian uh, or Romano-British um, archaeology has had their finger in the Burnswork pie right through to the, the current day. And up till about this point, it was always considered um, uh, the site of a siege, a genuine siege. But in the 1960s, George Joby um, carried out what has been to date the biggest and best excavation on the site, uh, the most thorough. And he, influenced by Kenneth Steer, um, who <coughs> made the suggestion first in 1964 that it was a battle school for the Roman army where they learned to build camps, but particularly it was an artillery range that allowed the, the Roman troops to um, have a combination of uh, ballista practice and also uh, slinging practice. So it was on that basis that George Joby um, um, published the work in the 1970s. And it got into the popular, popular literature at that point as a training camp um, and has gone on to be exemplified in various uh, popular works as the Roman army sort of looking into the sun, there's not much sun in Burnswork Hill, by the way, if anyone's ever been there, looking into the sun to see where the latest uh, missile has gone. Um, and that's how it was envisaged. And in fact, David Breeze very usefully has collated all of the arguments for and against and published this uh, a couple of years ago um, in the Archaeological <coughs> Journal. Um, at the end of that article, David had to come down uh, in favour of a training camp. 
But there have been voices of dissent, particularly from Duncan Campbell and uh, Lawrence Kepi, who have said um, quite, um, have argued quite strongly um, that it was indeed the site of an actual uh, uh, element of, of warfare. Um, and as Lawrence Kepi pointed out, the whole idea of battle schools and training camps um, came to the fore in the 1960s and 70s when there was a bit of a vogue for seeing unusual native uh, earthworks as potentially Roman training sites. And this is wooden law, and of course this was seen as a, as a siege work, a Roman siege work, and a couple of the little mounds and lumps were seen as ballista platforms. And these sites um, have been uh, reinterpreted, and particularly Cawthorn um, in England, and they've been reinterpreted actually as either a conventional Roman camp, as in the case of Cawthorn, or native works, as in the case of Wooden Law. So the bottom line is the data that we have is almost more than 50 years old, and it's been diced and sliced in just about any way that you like. So it can be used, some arguments can be used for a siege, some of the same arguments can be turned over on the back for a training camp. And there is uh, one in particular that I just want to mention here, because it's relevant to our findings, and that's the so-called alignment that's repeatedly mentioned in, in works. The alignment of the three brethren to the three uh, south-facing Hillfort gateways. Come back to that in a second. Another one that I want to um, just slightly emphasize is why were they using lead-sling bullets rather than much cheaper and much more economic clay-sling bullets that were prevalent at the same time. And the finds from Burnsworth, certainly the ballistic finds, are quite striking. There are indeed ballista balls, although these are slightly on the small size, and for those in the know, um, it's suspected that they're either hand-thrown stone balls, or they are slung stone balls, because some of them are about half a kilogram in weight. But there are undoubtedly two or three larger ones that were probably ballista balls. There are trial bait arrowheads, uh, nine of them so far, and they were found in the two gateway areas that Joby excavated, and that was new, they hadn't been found uh, before. The thing that we're interested in are the lead sling bullets, the glandes, and they come in two flavours in Burns' work. There's an acorn, a very distinct <coughs> acorn-shaped one, which is quite nice because it, it seems to rhyme with the, the word glandes, the, the, word, the Latin word for acorn and the lemon-shaped ones, and these have been called type A and type B, or type 1 and type 2, um, by Greek uh, in his review of sling bullets from Britain. And somehow, again, the acorn-shaped ones have got into the literature as being fairly widespread and the other shape, the other shape type um, of lead sling bullets. Our work has shown that, in fact, um, the, we've reviewed um, not just the sling bullets in the UK, but the sling bullets in Europe. Um, that these acorn-shaped ones are unique to the southwest of Scotland, um, and particularly to Burns' work. There are three, these three from Birrins, known as the Birrins Three, um, and there are two from just outside um, Stanek in Carlisle, and there's one from Housteads, and that's it, in the whole of the Roman Empire. The other reported so-called uh, acorn-shaped ones are indeed acorns if you take them out of the cup. So <laughs> they're lemon-shaped, effectively, but have been called acorns uh, mistakenly. So that somehow has got into the literature. The other thing that we've discovered is that there's a fair proportion of them have holes in them. 10% um, of the Burns work specimens, these are other specimens from Greece, from the British Museum, showing that these holes do occur. And Tracy Ryle in Wales has suggested that these are poison holes, as referred to in the ancient literature. We're not convinced, but they're certainly there. This is the group um, from the National Museum of Scotland, and I'd like to thank Peter Hunter for letting us uh, examine these. And they do indeed have these holes, and two of the specimens still have plugs of material in them. So it may be interesting to go on and have a look and see, uh, analyse what that material actually is. So they weren't <coughs> washed out at the time of the original excavations. So, on to our work. Um, Joby described um, gateways here and here, and there was another suggested gateway here to match this eastern um, titulus or, or ballista platform. Um, and he found 
uh, sling bullets in profusion at Western Gate and the Centre Gate. He found a single one at the so-called Eastern Gate, which in fact Joby went on to show was not a gate at all. The Palestinian <coughs> rampart um, had originally been con uh, continuous there. Um, and there was no evidence that there was um, actually a paved entrance as there was at the centre and in the West Gate. He also found one at the site of a native uh, roundhouse in this area B. And then, interestingly, almost every uh, trench at Burns Wharf turned up something interesting. There was a trial bay arrowhead in this very narrow trench one. And here in trench 11 on the north face uh, was in fact uh, an almost mint coin of uh, Domitian, a denarius of Domitian, and a Roman sword, lying not in a vote of context, but literally on the surface of, of the rampart. Um, and Joby did not offer a, an interpretation for why a Roman sword was there. Um, so, and then, latterly, in the planning that took place here in the forestry uh, plantation, uh, a, a lance head was found, which is suspiciously like the elongated ballista heads that are currently being found at Hartshorn in Germany. So Scarf said needed more work um, to try and sort out whether this was a siege or whether it was a training camp. And so Andy and I put our heads together and came up with a solution to use metal detecting as in conflict archaeology to look for artifact uh, distribution. Uh, there's nothing new about this. There are metal detect detected projectile scatters in numerous archaeological works um, throughout the world. It was pioneered in America at the Little Bighorn site, but also used extensively at English Civil War sites, Culloden, Killycranky, and uh, lesser well-known but important to us in terms of lead sling bullets, Baikula in Andalusia and Belsen. And for the sharp eye, that should actually be the Frisian Revolt, not the Batavian Revolt. So what was the dilemma for us? Well, unlike these other sites, Burns Work has a stratified site underneath where the potential scatter would be. So selective extraction of any finds would cause damage to the stratigraphy and to the interpretation of the site. So we came up with a research design um, to go to Historic Scotland, which suggested um, that we should carry out non-invasive uh, metal detection with profiling of the metals that were underneath the ground. Essentially a form of geophys but very, very accurate GFS, and then to practice, um, to, to take the targets, sorry, and log them via um, GIS to a map. Um, and this is an example of the sort of uh, way that the detector works. You get an absolute figure. This is a Roman iron nail. You get an absolute figure here and some idea of the depth and position of the object. And here you can see iron coming in at 0, 03, 0, 04. Here's a 303 cartridge, which we assumed, because there'd been a, a Second World War observation post on the top, we might find some. They come in at 70. And copper coins coming in over 90. But the most important thing, and quite separate from all the other readings, uh, are the readings from lead. And lead comes in on an average of 82. So these are the clusters of the um, profiles that we were uh, looking for. And of course, predominantly looking for lead targets. Um, we had our trusty detectress, retired occupational therapist, and a retired firearms officer from the Scottish Police Force. Um, and the detectress can cover an acre in about three hours um, with overlapping, um, overlapping sweeps. Um, the, surface of Burns Wharf not particularly lends itself to detection. There's a lot of reeds and marram grass, so only about 50% of the surface of the hill fort was detectable. More of the, uh, the Roman and uh, the north and south camps were detectable. The long grass like this keeps the detector head away from the, away from the surface. But the finds we did make, um, we made 420 finds um, over the course of the five days. And Andy assiduously um, recorded their uh, geolocation um, and also the metal profile. At this point, I'm going to say something briefly about the difference between clay and lead shot 
play shop is, is quite prevalent um, from numerous sites in Scotland, but because it's clay, to get the same ballistic profile as lead, it has to be much bigger, it has to be substantially chunkier than the lead shot. And that, of course, has a ballistic uh, difference in terms of penetration. So if you compare a 30 millimeter marble with a, a 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter um, lead projectile, you can see that the marbles do actually penetrate, but the lead balls go straight through. They, they go through ballistic gelatin as if it's not there. Um, whereas the golf ball can't even get beyond the skin. And this led us to look more at the stopping power of lead slingshot. And a 50 gram lead slingshot fired from a sling is just less than a 44 magnum in terms of its kinetic energy. So obviously using lead carries with it a considerably greater ballistic advantage. Um, there are also, when we looked into the slinging profile, there are two ways to sling a lead ball. You can either have a lob, a very high trajectory lob, that will get you between 300 and 400 meters out from the slinger, or, as is used currently in the Balearic Islands for competition and so on, that if you wanted to aim directly at something, you go at 100 or 150 meters with a much lower profile sling. So this is an example of the lob, very high trajectory, easily 300 meters, which is longer than the composite bow, um, but. When you're using direct attack, it's a horizontal approach and it's very, very accurate. And accuracy is recorded both from modern sliggers and also from the ancients, which show that uh, accuracy to the, the size of a head is fairly standard at 100 metres. Um, and the effect of lead is substantial. Um, in striking something that's relatively soft. So, the front rampart of Burnsworth is exactly optimum slinging distance for direct slinging practice, um, or not for the, for the practice of direct slinging. Um, and these are the fine sites from our um, survey, and you can see that there's a fair scatter, but there are a predominance of slingshots all the way along the front rampart. We take these ones here to be overflies, because if you just narrowly miss the front rampart, you will overfly by a substantial distance because of the trajectory. And these are rollbacks caused by erosion um, over, the, over the intervening centuries. If you profile the targets, the x-axis is the absolute target ID. So if you profile these lead um, comes out, we have 205 pr probable new sling bullets still <coughs> in, the, in the soil, uh, over 100 new iron targets, and then copper alloy, um, a relatively small number. These are almost certainly shotgun cartridges. They have a fairly characteristic uh, profile. We're not sure about these, and these are probably a mixed bag of coins and probably um, some of the very smaller sling bullets, the ones with the holes in them. And you can see the spread. Um, the gateways for Joby predicted um, the targets were um, are actually only part of the whole picture. And if you group the, the uh, uh, individual sling bullets to the higher density areas, you can see that they run predominantly along the front of the rampart and not just at the gates, over a distance of about 200 meters. And this is exactly the area that, if you were to attack the fort, has got the best incline for troops running up after uh, some uh, forward shot. So, just to mention briefly, Mike Bishop said it's one thing to drop a small denomination coin, quite another to lose a sword. And so, I think we have to think about why these projectiles are there and, and not just assume that they've been left over. Um, by, uh, by a, a, an aspect of practice. So, um, our conclusions are uh, non-invasive detecting is probably useful on an appropriate site type. Burns work is almost unique. The soil is shallow, there's been no ploughing, it's never been arable land really, so there is not much in the way of iron or, or other material contamination. So we're finding a disproportionately high number of, of good targets. Um, 
we think the sling bullets are aimed directly in this low profile type of slinging uh, at a wide area of rampart, not just at the gateways. Um, and from an extension of that interpretation, and um, that this was probably an assault rather than a siege. Uh, we, 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 a siege <coughs> would suggest the Romans camped there for quite a long time and tried to starve out the natives. I suspect that probably when it came to it, it was just an all out attack um, from a defended encampment. Um, and then magnitude of the site, because of the magnitude of material left over, um, it looks like a use of exemplary force, and you can speculate about what the cause of that might have been. Um, we think that we need to do a lot more work on the studies of the slingshot, both on the ballistics of it, and also this vexed question of whether they are truly poisoned or not. Um, and so a further phase of investigation is required. Um, in September, we'll be completing the metal detector survey of the site. Um, a team from Frankfurt coming over to help us with further geophysical survey on the site to nail down once and for all, hopefully, um, if there was or wasn't circumvallation <coughs> around the site. Um, we're going to carry out limited ground truthing because, of course, we've still to prove that these targets are what we think they are, although we're fairly confident that the lead targets are sling bullets. Um, because in previous excavations, less than 3% of the lead objects found were anything other than lead sling bullets. And then there's metallurgy on the lead and toxicology on the plugs within the lead. So I'd like to thank Sir John Buchanan Jarden, who's taken an interest in this work, the landowner who's uh, been very supportive. We'd like to thank our friends at Historic Scotland, National Museum, Glasgow University, the Treasure Trove Unit, and the Police Museums. And finally, Last word I would imagine would go to the anonymous presenter of this paper in 1792 who said, the whole to me suggests the idea of a siege. <laughs> Thank you all very much.